Greetings, one and all. We celebrate God's covenant today as we hear his word, the gospel word, and as we uh, participate in the sacrament of infant baptism. We rejoice with family and friends and his congregation that God calls us together at this occasion and always to worship him. Here from the scriptures themselves, Psalm 148, our call to worship And notice how the children are included in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. And then this, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. And he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Beloved congregation, we have a Lord who is truly the Lord. He's the maker of heaven and earth, and he's the Lord also of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And so we are purchased with the precious blood of the Lamb, and we praise God for that forgiveness and that wonderful uh, assurance that we have through faith that We don't belong to ourselves or to sin or to circumstance. We belong to Jesus, our faithful Savior. Receive God's benediction that we might worship him in spirit and truth. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 303. Uh, Oh, sing ye hallelujah. Let's sing stanzas one, two, four, and six of 303.
We read now from the law of God, and I want to read this morning from Deuteronomy 5. And let us be reminded that in this context, the people of God are publicly called to obedience as they're about to enter the land of promise. It's the second giving of the law, hence the name Deuteronomy, second law. And so they're on the plains of Moab, and they're about to enter in. But the land of Canaan is not only full of promise, but it's full of Canaanites. Those are lawbreakers, and the cup of their iniquity is full, just like, at least almost today, the cup of iniquity of this society that's so decadent is all but full, and judgment is swift to come and sure to come. But so the covenanted people is reminded of what they ought to be in that land of vanity and wickedness. And they ought to be a people of God and show that and we show that today in our listening to God and walking in his ways. And this is something also, as we'll learn in Deuteronomy 6, that is the incumbent upon parents of covenant children to teach their children to walk in the ways of God. The principal educators of the children are the parents, of course, with the grandparents and and the friends and the family and the congregation, but principally the parents. So there's a great calling here. So read the law of God in light of what we ought to do in this land and how we ought to behave and how we ought to teach our children to behave. I am the Lord your God, God says to us, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment is this, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And notice here, the whole house is called to keep Sabbath, this one holy day in seven. And it's something we're reminded of as we consider the houses that God makes in the sermon this morning. The motivation for keeping Sabbath and resting in God is, remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The fifth commandment comes to all children, young and old. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder is the sixth commandment. The seventh is you shall not commit adultery. The Eighth Commandment of God, you shall not steal. The Ninth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So all of those Ten Commandments written originally on tables of stone, two tables, front and back, the entire revealed will of God for his people, for all men, especially for his covenanted people. And they're indelibly put so that this is the permanent will of God for all of us. We, however, receive these ten. In light of what Jesus says is the summary of them all, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We also receive these commandments in light of the gospel of what that deliverance from Egypt really meant to the Israelites. It means we are delivered from the bondage, the guilt, and the tyranny of sin. Delivered unto the fellowship of God. That's the gospel. Hear the law in light of the gospel. And enter the land of promise, and in that land be shining lights of the holy God, you and your children. Let's sing now in the um, next order of worship is our singing, number 166. <clears throat> Zion founded on the mountains. And we'll sing the three stanzas of this versification of number uh, Psalm 87. Now, at the occasion of the baptism of the infinite covenant child of Eric and Kirsten Osterbahn, we want to turn to the form for that in the back of our Psalter hymnals. And in my Psalter hymnal, it's page 123. After the creeds is the forms for the sacraments and other such things. As we read through the form for this, reminded that we're not to be formalistic, we're not relying on a form to take the place of the Word of God, but forms are to help us orderly and biblically as well to be guided from the Word of God and into the Word with regard to these holy matters. And so we can, we don't have to rethink how we're going to say what baptism is and so on, but here summarized in the form are the biblical truths of God's covenant, his mercy to us and to our children, and also our responsibilities. And as the parents will presently present their child for baptism, we're reminded of the awesomeness of both the blessing and the responsibilities. So listen carefully here, and we'll find that we are blessed in the reading of this form together. Form number one, the baptism of infants, beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ. The principal parts of the doctrine of holy baptism are these three. First, that we with our children are conceived and born in sin, and therefore are children of wrath, so that we cannot enter into the kingdom of God except we are born again. 
This dipping in or sprinkling with water teaches us whereby the impurity of our souls is signified. We may be admonished to loathe ourselves, humble ourselves before God, and seek for our purification and salvation apart from ourselves. Second, holy baptism witnesses and seals unto us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are baptized into the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For when we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father witnesses and seals unto us that he makes an eternal covenant of grace with us, and adopts us for his children and heirs, and therefore will provide us with every good thing, and avert all evil or turn it to our profit. And when we are baptized into the name of the Son, the Son seals unto us that he washes us in his blood from all our sins, incorporating us into the fellowship of his death and resurrection, so that we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. Likewise, when we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit assures us by this holy sacrament that he will dwell in us and sanctify us to be members of Christ, imparting to us that which we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without spot among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. And third, whereas in all covenants there are contained two parts, therefore are we by God through baptism admonished of and obliged unto new obedience, namely, that we cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we trust in him and love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, that we forsake the world, crucify our old nature, and walk in a godly life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sins, we must not therefore despair of God's mercy, nor continue in sin, since baptism is a seal, an indubitable testimony that we have an eternal covenant with God. And although our young or our children do not understand these things, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism, since they are without their knowledge partakers of the condemnation of Adam, and so again received unto grace in Christ. As God speaks unto Abraham, the father of all believers, and therefore also to us and our children, saying, I will establish my covenant between thee and thee, and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. That's Genesis 17, verse 7, which also Peter quotes. Uh, this also Peter testifies with these words, and this was on Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the New Testament. For to you is the promise and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him, Acts 2, 39. Therefore God formerly commanded to circumcise them, which was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith, as also Christ embraced them and laid his hands upon them and blessed them, as we read in the gospel according to Mark. Since then baptism has come in the place of circumcision, the children should be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant, and as they grow up, the parents shall be bound to give them further instruction in these things. That we therefore may administer this holy ordinance of God to his glory, to our comfort, and to the edification of the church. Let us together call upon the name of God. Let's pray. Almighty eternal God, thou who hast, according to thy severe judgment, punish the unbelieving and unrepentant world with a flood, and hast according to thy great mercy saved and protected believing Noah and his family. Thou hast drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, and led thy people Israel through the midst of the sea upon dry ground, by which baptism was signified. We beseech thee, that thou wilt be pleased of thine infinite mercy, graciously to look upon these thy children and incorporate them by thy Holy Spirit into thy Son, Jesus Christ, that they may be buried with him through baptism unto death, be raised with him in newness of life, that they daily following him may joyfully bear their cross, cleaving unto him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love, that they being comforted in thee may leave this life which is nothing but a constant death, 
and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ thy Son, through him, our Lord Jesus Christ, who with thee and the Holy Spirit, only one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Now I'd like to ask uh, Eric and Kirsten Osterbond to rise and receive this exhortation and then answer the following questions. After the uh, questions are answered and after the baptism is administered, we'll have the congregation rise and sing stanza five of 209, if you can be ready for that. But first of all, I want to address you, Eric and Kirsten, Beloved in Christ, dear friends in the Lord, brother and sister of the family of God. Beloved in Christ the Lord, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of God to seal unto us and our seed his covenant. Therefore, it must be used for that end, not out of mere custom or certainly superstition. That it may then be manifest that you are thus minded, you are to answer sincerely to these questions. First, do you acknowledge that our children, though conceived and born in sin, and therefore subject to all manner of misery, yea, to condemnation itself, are sanctified in Christ, and therefore as members of his church ought to be baptized? Second, do you acknowledge the doctrine which is contained in the Old and the New Testament, and in the articles of the Christian faith, and which is taught here in this Christian church, to be the true and complete doctrine of salvation? And third, do you promise and intend to, see, to instruct this child as soon as she is able to understand in the aforesaid doctrine and cause her to be instructed therein to the utmost of your power? Eric and Kirsten, what is your answer? I ask you now to rise and present Rebecca for holy baptism. got to face the congregation so we can all see this. Rebecca, Elida, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Congratulations, Eric. God's blessing upon you. Kirsten, God's blessing upon you. Let's all rise and sing and celebrate the mercies of God. Number 209, stanza 5, will sing a cappella. And this is a celebration of what God does and his truth, uh, its wonderful way with us and our children. Jehovah's What a great blessing is it to be in the fellowship of God together. God makes a home, one home, many homes, family by family, saving us and our children, as many as he's pleased. But in this way, in our blessing his holy name, in his blessing us with the word of his grace and favor to us and our children. What a great God. Forgiven, sanctified in Christ, we and our children. And we have every reason to live unto him. And so we give thanks. Let's do this in prayer together, shall we?
that thou hast forgiven us and our children all our sins with the blood of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We thank and praise thee that you receive us through the Holy Spirit as members of thine only begotten Son. And so adopt us to be thy children, and you seal and confirm the same to us by this sacred sacrament that we see, holy baptism. We beseech thee also through him, thy beloved Son, that thou wilt always govern this child by thy Holy Spirit, that she may be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness, and may grow and increase in the Lord Jesus Christ in order that she may acknowledge thy fatherly goodness and mercy, which thou dost show to her and to us all, and that she might live in all righteousness under our only teacher, King and High Priest, Jesus Christ, and manfully fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion to the end, that she may eternally praise and magnify thee and thy Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one only true God. Indeed, we are thankful, Lord, for your blessings are life, and they come from the fount of our election and of your grace. And who can comprehend the wonderful fount and the stream of blessings that flow down from heaven to us? We praise your name because you blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These things earth cannot afford, but you did and you could, and you have purchased for us these blessings through the giving of your Son on the cross, who is worthy of our praise, the preeminent one, the mediator of the covenant of grace. Thanks for your word, which is yea and amen in him, for your promises that shall never be revoked, which are free and which are received by faith, by which we embrace all that you say in your word is ours personally. And so we pray your blessing upon the family Osterbahn, the families that are represented here in related by blood and flesh, but also in the spirit that together we may be one family and hold forth the truth of the word of the family life of your covenant mercies to Abraham and to his seed, even as to many as believe like him. And now who believe like New Testament believers to whom the promises have come. Lord, we thank you for that home whose builder and maker is God. We thank you for the foundations of the blood by which we know that we stand on the rock and all our home building is not in vain as we believe in the rock and believe in the cross and believe in the empty tomb and believe in the promises of Jesus coming again. So we pray, Father, may this congregation and family and friends gathered here to worship celebrate. May we be turned towards heaven as we hear the word presently and are moved to faith, and as we behold and have beheld before our very eyes the sacrament that we might be confirmed in our faith. So we pray, Father, to come away as those who are closer to you and who are drawn closer to you and then to be your servants. For you remind us even in the forms of the church that there are in all covenants two parts. You are the God who saves sovereignly, wonderfully and graciously, and we are the people who respond. And in responding, we pray to be as the Israel of old, about to enter the land of Canaan, the promised land. We pray to be holy and godly among the Canaanites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites and the Girgasites. We pray to be holy among those whose cup of iniquity is all but full. We pray to be holy in witness 
that others may be gained and engrafted into the family life of God. We pray to have purpose. We pray, Father, that we may not flit about here on this earth with no purpose or go about with great anxiety, seeking gain of this world, helter-skelter, investing in this and that, but instead be focused. Give us focus. Give Eric and Kirsten focus. The priority of their faith and for the sake of this little one and as many others as you give to this family. May the whole family be united in focus, seeking the kingdom first and the righteousness of Christ, believing in, and so we know that all things will be added unto us. We shall be guarded defended, preserved forever because of your sovereign, irrevocable mercies. God bless us all with the weight of this ceremony impressed upon our hearts, but also with the great joy and exhilaration, for we behold even before our very eyes by faith the things it means. There is cleansing for us dirty ones. There is justification for us guilty ones. There's glory for us who've gone astray. This is what the sacrament means. This is what we stand for. And also this family who've answered with their hearts and minds the questions put to them with all sincerity and truth. And so bless us together. We celebrate. We give you honor and glory and praise. We celebrate you revealed in the Lamb of God, who is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Hear our prayers, Lord. Bless your church everywhere in all her way, trials and struggles. Bless our own families in their difficulties and trials. Help us to be above the vanity, even as we consider the victory as in, that is in Jesus Christ, and that we have no reason to fear, because all is well. He is in heaven and coming again. Lord, may this message be what is clearly and loudly proclaimed from every pulpit in the land. And may the true church be gathered unto you and built up in the most holy faith, individual by individual, family by family, into the embrace, into the arms, and the fellowship of you, our God. Hear our prayers, pardon our many sins, sanctify the rest of our service as well. For Christ's sake, amen. <clears throat> this time your offering will be received. May the Lord bless us as we give to the cause of Christ here in this church. Let's take our Psalter hymnals now and sing from them, number 269, Unless the Lord builds, or the house shall build, is the title of the song, and it's a versification of Psalm 127, of which we'll be speaking presently, Psalm 127. 
Let's uh, sing all four stanzas, 269. I'd like to turn with you at this time to the Bible at Psalm 127. Psalm 127 has as its subheading two things. First, that this is a song of a sense, one of the 15 or so psalms In fact, that Israel would be singing on the way to Jerusalem to worship God at the various stated solemnities or festivals to which they were called. So they would ascend up to Jerusalem, which was founded on the mountains, as we sung. And the seven hills of Jerusalem were also a prominent geographical uh, figure in the, in the environment. But secondly, we're told here that this is a psalm of Solomon, and we have no reason to doubt that he penned it. Uh, certainly, this is about Solomon or reflecting upon something that was vital to his being the king in Israel after Father David. So with that in mind, let's sing psalm, or, or uh, read Psalm 127, God's Word, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Thus far we read God's infallible word, which is a celebration of family and of 
houses and homes. An outstanding psalm, in fact, one of the two outstanding ones, this with Psalm 128 following, which celebrate homes in Israel, the things that God builds and that he defends, that he blesses. Especially is this a celebration of the fruit of the womb, that is, the children, which are said to be in Psalm 127, 3, a heritage from the Lord and a reward, so that to have these children is to have, as it were, a quiver full of arrows to defend oneself from the enemies, and this is all for the blessedness of the covenant families in Israel. So a celebration of family and of the various homes that God makes in his embrace, the homes of the people of God, the homes of God himself. Fitting then that at the occasion of the baptism of Rebecca, of the Osterbahn family, we now turn to this psalm, be reflective for a few moments here, and I want us truly to be personal and to reflect upon what this word means to Eric and Kirsten, but also to their relatives, and also to the family, and also to the church family at Sovereign Grace. This is a wonderfully great occasion that God uh, leads us to, and it reminds us of his faithfulness towards us in the generations too and reminds us also of his mercies in Jesus Christ. So I want to just think about the whole psalm at this point. I'd like to come back to this and uh, uh, deal with this more uh, in detail at future times, maybe baptisms, but here the whole psalm. And consider the houses and the heritage and the happiness that is presented here, and also that this may be uh, what the... Osterbahn family experiences, and we do too. The houses that God makes, the heritage that he gives, and the happiness that is the blessing of the homes that God makes. Well, first of all, I want to consider three homes divine. Three homes, not just one, not just the ones you're thinking of, maybe, but three homes divine. And then, so there's the number three, children. You got three. Remember, three homes divine. And then the second point is countless blessings sublime. That's how I have us remember that. There's countless things you can't even count, the blessings that are in these homes. And then finally, one builder. For in this text, it speaks of the Lord building the house is absolutely indispensable or all is vanity. So the one builder, and I want to make this personal, the one builder who's mine and yours and to all of us who call on the Lord. So first, the three homes divine. Perhaps we're focused too much on our homes. And I find in my ministry that that's often the cause of marital problems and family problems. Focusing too much on the home, you say? How can that be a problem? Well, we focus too much on the home when we're forgetting the other home that God makes, and that is his place of fellowship with us. I call it a home. The Bible speaks of that metaphorically. as God, when he saves us, making a home for us with him. What I'm saying here is that often families, maybe newlyweds and maybe those with one child, they receive the child, can be over-focused, focused over much on just their home and just what this is for them and the great event of baptism and, and buying things for the child and, and making sure the, the child uh, sleeps once in a while so that you can sleep once in a while. But the answer the answer to the problems we can have, and, but also the reason for blessing that I pray you will experience, Eric and Kirsten, focus on the home that God makes, the salvation that God gives, 
In fact, that's really what we're led to in this psalm. Remember I read that this is a song of Solomon. Whether he wrote, wrote it himself or it's about him. Remember Solomon, what Solomon did? He was used of God to build the temple. The temple. And so, not surprising that he would sing or that a psalmist would write of Solomon's great concern about building the house of the Lord, because that's what the temple in the Old Testament was, the house of the Lord. Now, God, of course, doesn't need a house in the sense that he has a body and he needs to rest and sit down, but he has so condescended, he's come down to us, that he speaks in different ways in various times of how much he wants to be near us. So he makes his home right in the midst of this people in this earth. And in the Old Testament, that was a temple. And there would be a cloud of glory that would meet the people of God as they met with God and offered their offerings. And that cloud, that Shekinah, God dwelling with the people, glory, would indicate that God was near and they were near God, and all was well. You see, there was blood there. It was all picturing how God now makes us a place and himself a place with us in Jesus through the blood that he shed on Calvary. And so the home that results from this work of God, God building the home, is nothing less than our fellowship with God. That's the blessing. And that's the home you've got to think about young lady and young man and little girl, Rebecca. The home of God, the fellowship of God, the great salvation that he gives. You see, it's a rare thing nowadays that people think of that home. We're too busy building our own homes, thinking about a second home. Well, some people are just wondering if they're going to have a roof over their heads. We're so spoiled almost in the United States. We think about second homes. And we little focus on our place with God and the glory of salvation. The Lord builds a house. He caused his son to be broken for us, and all our sins forgiven, and, and now he comes in the Spirit, who in John is called a homemaker. Jesus says, I'm going away, but the Spirit who comes, he's going to make your hearts a home, and he's going to make your families a home, because he works heart by heart, but also in the communion of our own flesh and blood, and miraculously fulfills the promises to Abraham, to us and our children, and to the thousand generations to come. Not everyone, but this is his way, so that they are this heritage of the Lord, and so is Rebecca. And I say not many people think of this because not many people understand anything other than what they can see and anything other than their living room, or their bedrooms, or their kitchens, or their decks, their earthly houses. Don't understand what home is. You know, that's why this world is broken. And that's the world that Rebecca enters and has entered. A broken world full of broken homes. In the beginning, it wasn't so, was it? God made this earth, and it was his home. The whole earth was his home, especially East in Eden. That was a home for God and Adam and Eve. An unbroken fellowship, that was home. That was their home. And the terribleness of sin, the catastrophe that sin was in rebelling against God was, they were kicked out of the home. Just judgment of God. But ever since then, God has been about revealing how he's the homemaker by grace. And so remember that. Unless the Lord builds the house, the Lord there is used here, meaning Jehovah God, the covenant saving, homemaking for sinners God. 
unless the Lord builds the house and lays the foundation on the blood of the Lamb. It's all vain. It's all empty. Unless there's faith in Christ, who cares what mansion you have? Who cares where you live? Your second home, your third. You can count them all up. Count all your riches up. Parents do this all the time. They teach their children that way. The way of money. The way of toys and toys and toys. And it's vanity. It's striking. Solomon also wrote Ecclesiastes. And that's what leads us to think this is penned by Solomon. Certainly about him. He knew what vanity was. Emptiness, purposelessness, and futility. Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. All the homemaking is vanity. Even in the church, all is vanity, except there be true faith and a true and sincere answer to questions with, coupled with a resolve, we're going to do this thing called home. We're going to be a believing home. All is vanity except the Lord builds the house. So that's the first divine home, and you've got to think about that. Eric and Kirsten and Osterbonds and all the friends and the family and the congregation right here. Focus on that. For your marriage, as you raise a child, this is the thing, this view, this perspective, this believingness in your home, and this love of God. That's the first home. The second that's brought out, and I'll just go order by order here, is a city. <clears throat> There's a city. Lest the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And I think the home that's meant there is Jerusalem, the home of believers together. And they go up to the mountain, to the house of God, and they find there, lo and behold, the church. The believers gather together in that urban environment of Jerusalem and surrounding areas. And this is delightful because they wouldn't often get to come together to this whole church universal, as it were, well, church of the nation of Israel. And so they could see their brothers of the tribes and their sisters of the tribes. And, and this is indeed the city of Jerusalem, a picture in the New Testament of the church of every nation, tribe, and tongue. That's a home too. And that also is something that families need to consider and married couples need to consider, as we're thinking of God, our home, and of the fact that we're not the only ones. We need to consider that baptism is about the church's observance of the sacrament, not just one family's. It's about the whole congregation expressing that we are family. And as the saying goes, it takes a village meaning we're here with you. We got your back. We are with you in the raising of this child. We are with you in celebrating. We are with you in empathy in difficult times. We are with you to rejoice. We are with one another. We are brothers and sisters and, and then part of the broader body of Christ. And it's so beautiful, so beautiful. Have that perspective. But then, of course, remember your home. And who could forget? But there is one thing we can forget in the earthliness of our homes and the building of them and in the planning of our earthly additions to homes and pole barns and so on. It's a divine thing. It's a divine thing. The family Osterbahn is of the Lord. This is what you're saying. This is what baptism says. This is your conviction. This is our conviction. Our homes, if they be other than the homes of vain land, are homes divine. You see, there's lots of people making homes. 
and making a living and establishing businesses and so on. The Bible says here, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. They never get off the ground, really. There's no foundation. Jesus reminds us, as much as you might listen to the Sermon on the Mount, if you don't build on the rock, build on sinking sand, your home is going to collapse. It's collapsible. It's, it's bound to fail. The children may be raised and in the in the fear of man, I suppose, and in the kind of morality, they might go to Harvard, they might work on Wall Street. But if they're not founded in the Lord, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. That's all society can produce. So just remember those three homes. The home of God, the life with God, the church of Christ, and your home divine of the Lord. May God bless you as you have those three in mind. But then, I want you to remember a number called countless. Can't count that. I remember when I was a child, first grade, why this keeps coming up. But my first grade teacher wrote the number Google. That was a number, I think. One with a hundred zeros on the board. That's a lot of zeros. And that was really impressive. See, I still remember that. And that was at least 20 years ago for me. A Google. And now Google. Go figure. You can't. You can't. One with all those zeros. How many blessings do you have? Beyond that. Beyond that. That's life with God. That's the beauty of being a Christian. Countless blessings. And even... If we just think of one, you can't really account for it. You can't. And it doesn't matter how many children you have, or if you have any. If you're not even married. Because in God is this amazing communication from heaven to earth that says, I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to raise you up. And that's what we teach our children. Of something that's higher than your bed. It's higher than mom and dad. It's higher than the joys of a happy time at the ice cream shop or on vacation. Something that's from heaven designed, intended, planned, and then executed so that you are convicted there is a God that you can't see, but who loves me and who forgives me and loves my children, forgives them, and who sets me free from that bondage and depravity into which I'm born, so that I'm truly free and I don't have to worry. See here how the, the psalmist speaks of the building that's not by faith. People are doing this and that and they're staying up at night guarding their treasure, guarding their city, guarding their home. They have security systems. They, you know, make sure that they have they're protected on the internet and make sure that nobody steals their credit card. And they get up early and they stay up late and theirs is called the bread of sorrows in verse 2. And they really can't sleep the sleep of the righteous, of course, because they're the unrighteous in the, in the world. That's how we're born. And God says, the house of the wicked is cursed 
You notice that in Proverbs 3? That's Solomon's word too. Proverbs 3, 33. The house of the wicked is cursed, but he blesses the habitation of the just. The whole house, whole business, whole family, outside of the house of God and the church of Christ and outside of the grace of God is truly outside blessing. And under the wrath of God. But we're blessed. Just think of that, the blessing of grace, so that, as verse 2 says, we're beloved. He gives his beloved sleep. We're beloved. And sleep, you know, there's a gospel in sleep. We have signs and symbols of the sacrament, of the covenant of grace, ministered from time to time. Preaching of the gospel, the means of grace. You ever realize what a holy thing sleep is? One third of our life spent sleeping. And if it's the sleep of the righteous, I tell you, it's a sign that all is well in heaven and we don't have to worry. It's a sign of peace. Not mere inactivity, but real sleep. And then when we die, called sleep because we die in the, in the arms of Jesus and we're going to see our Savior, we don't have to fear death. And there, wonderful blessing. Peace with God. Described here uh, later on in verses 3 through 5 as having children who are a heritage from the Lord, more on that presently, but who are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. And the man is happy who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with their enemies in the gate. And as different interpretations of that expression, they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. But I, I find that it's certainly something like this from the earthly picture used to be especially if a man had stalwart sons and daughters fair, then he need not fear because they could hold the fort. And they could draw the sword, they could, we, we would say, they could shoot straight, and they could be arrows, and our enemies would tremble, they wouldn't even try to assault us. But now look at the picture. You know what enemies are in the Bible? In the Old Testament, all the enemies of the Israelites were enemies of God, whether they're Canaanites or whatever they were. And these were pictures of the enemy of the devil and his host. So God gave us a picture of what it's like to be in the house of God, in the city of God, and defended by God, and built by God, and, and having this family. And knowing this, the principal thing that we know as a Christian, the enemy, the devil, the sin, and our own flesh has no say in who we are. And they might come to the gate, and they might pester you and whisper in your ear and, and shout. And there you are looking down, and they'll remind you of your sin. And you will speak with them, and it won't be conciliatory, it won't be a powwow, it won't be a truce. It'll be a declaration, be gone, enemies. My friend is Jesus. The friend of this home is my Savior. The friend of the church is my captain. The mediator of the covenant is Jesus Christ, and he has atoned for every sin. And when I sin, he works in me a godly sorrow, and this is what you teach your little one. So that we fly to Jesus, and in his arms we find rest. And not even sin can keep us from the sleep of the righteous and the knowledge that Jesus says more than Satan ever can. And so we call to mind the words that God gives us. Those are certainly blessings in the covenant of grace and in the house of God. Peace with God, victory over enemies, but 
of course, the children are presented here as the great blessing of the home. Your child. Great blessing. We talked about that as we met yesterday. And I looked in Rebecca's eyes and she smiled. And I was blessed. And I hope that you can be blessed with a smile of your child. These smiles aren't really natural things. Oh, in a way they are. People even born in ungodly homes and so on, they'll have children who smile when you tickle them, when you feed them, when you care for them. Sometimes just naturally the smile comes out, but even then, in a covenant home, smiles mean something even more. But let me go back to the nature of the child and, and the, how the bless <laughs> children themselves are blessing. And, and the one thing is the lesson that they, they give us of dependency, complete dependency, if you haven't figured that out yet, Complete reliance on mom and sometimes dad. Sure. Complete helplessness. You know what they're there for? You know why Jesus took the little infants that were brought to him in his arms and blessed them? Because he knew they themselves would be a blessing in the covenant of grace because they're such educators who have no articulation except Google, Gaga, and a, a couple of cries or more. And a smile or a frown. But this dependence on you, and this need at every hour of the, of the day, and this not knowing where to turn, and so they cry out, and they want mom, and they want dad, and, and they want help from these two people in their lives who are the helpers who are the saviors, as it were, the preservers of this child, the defenders. And we're taught that's what we need to be. Because as we grow and we're strong, then we can shoot a gun and we can build a house and we have a job and we have money in the bank, then we become so cussedly independent self-reliant, and we hardly pray anymore until hard times come, and then we learn. But it should be until the baby comes. When the baby comes, then we learn constantly because it's a 24-7 presence of the lesson of trust. our need for that. But they're a heritage of the Lord. That's what's brought out here. Behold it. Look at it. They're a heritage of the Lord. Meaning, in the first place, that they're God's own possession. That's the word heritage can mean that. But they're given to us. That's Rebecca. She's given to you. But she's the Lord. She's just yours for a little while, and not even then completely yours. You're just stewards of this child of the Lord for a little while. Yours to care for, but a heritage of the Lord. And note here, and this is why we baptize them, it's not behold adults or a heritage from the Lord. Behold Children who confess their faith, who show even signs of faith, are a heritage of the Lord. But just children, the ones that God gives, they're a heritage of the Lord. God's people. So baptism is a sign not of what they do with salvation, but what of, of what God does to save them. That's the Reformed perspective on baptism. God is the God of us and our children. Lovely. That's full of hope. 
You're not raising heathen. You can teach that child to pray. And you call them to repent and believe and, and to grow in the knowledge of God. And you tell them to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And, and it's not mom and dad over here and you over there. We're wondering about you. We're in fellowship with you, Rebecca, and, and everyone else in the home. And, and we love you and, and we call upon God with praise for you. Great blessings. And then finally this. Remember the one builder. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards a city, the watchman stays in awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. God, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is in the whole business of homemaking. He's the first great architect of the homes. He's the master planner and he's the builder. He's everything. And that's all encompassing. Just think of all the builders that are involved in the building of a home. Drywallers, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, and everything. Everything. Start to finish in the plans and all that. This text says there's only one builder, really. Only one sovereign here. Only one who is at the construction site. Only one who, if he's not at the construction site, this spells doom. That's God, the Lord, who builds the home and then he guards it, and he and he alone sovereignly. This is a, one of those texts that once again says, Israel, your help is in the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, and lo and behold, he makes houses in the heavens and the earth. And right here, right here, on your street, on my street, in this church, in the church down the road, it might be a true church. He makes these homes, he makes these outposts not only, but he fortifies them with his word and with his truth. And he does this all alone. To be sure, he uses the one man called the mediator, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is sent to build the homes. Jesus Christ is sent, and he is the one who says that on the confession of P Peter, the, the truth, he says, I will build my church. Jesus Christ establishes his home with you when he sends his spirit and forgives your sin personally. Jesus Christ establishes the church so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he's, you see, the one who is not arguing with the enemy in the gate, but he's shouting them down and saying, you've come this far, go no further. Sin and Satan, there is no condemnation for my people. So the Lord through Jesus builds the house. But I do want to leave you with this, Eric and Kirsten. That God is sovereign in the house building and that he's the one alone who blesses doesn't mean you have no part, you have a very vital part in the raising of Rebecca and the establishment and the prosperity of your home. It's right in the text. Unless the Lord builds the home, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays in, awake in vain. You see, the text is not saying here, that there's not going to be any other builders who are involved in this building. It's just saying, don't be vain about it and deny that the Lord is the sovereign builder. Fact is, God uses many builders. He uses Jesus Christ, the mediator, and Jesus calls us to pick up a hammer and to hammer on our knees in prayer. And he calls us as he builds the home to teach our children 
And he calls us to teach them well, sometimes by word, always by example, so that they have a pattern of Jesus himself to follow in you. Jesus calls us to be a godly husband and a godly wife, and that is the thing that's going to teach your child how to be a Christian and how to relate to people. The health of your marriage. Jesus calls you grandparents and calls you uncles and aunts to be with this, with this team that God is employing in the raising of his children, in this home that he's making. He calls the church to be a part of it. And so you see this responsibility just comes right out of the text and only let it be a believing response to what God does. Believing that God himself is the author and the finisher of our salvation, the layer of the foundation of the home, and the one who gives the increase, who saves sinners, and who blesses us beyond what we could ask or speak. Oh, he may cause us to make some money, to pound a nail, to teach our children, but only God gives the increase. But that's good, because then we can be assured, as this young couple can, that God will bless your home. So may God bless your home. Among the three homes, with countless blessings, so that you know God is the indispensable builder and he uses you for the glory of his name. And he will be assured of that. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel of your home making and your blessing and your grace. We thank you, Father, that you are the God of promise, and we receive the great gift of a child, a child of covenant, with great hope and joy. And we pray that we all may be exhilarated, and led to things above, as we've attempted to speak of the things above in a sermon, and to hear, God bless us with faith, Encourage us, instill in us a resolve. We're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to trust in him who builds our homes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our last hymn is number 304, Psalter. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Let's sing the three stanzas of 304.
After the benediction, we'll sing the doxology printed in your bulletin. May the grace of Christ, our Savior, receive God's parting blessing and go in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.